after they, they uh, drank their second cup of barium, you're gonna take your second KUV. Remember I said, by the time they're done with that second cup, it's about 15 minutes later. So now, what, what time would this image be? 30 minutes. It'll, this'll be your 30 minute KUV. So in it's 30 minutes because it counts from the very first cup, right? Yeah, because we're starting, we're, we're timing it uh -huh. from the very first time. So the moment that they start drinking their first cup, it takes about 15 minutes to do the upper GI procedure, okay? The doctor's part. Mm -hmm. So now that the doctor is done, we take our overheads, and when we start taking our overheads, we're about 15 minutes in. Does that make sense, guys? So first cup is at zero minutes? First cup is at zero minutes. Exactly. KUB 15, second KUB 30. Yes. Okay. Yeah, first at 15, the second one's at 30. Okay. And so now this stuff over here will start making sense. When we do a small bowel series, all we're doing is taking KUBs. That's a small bowel series. Nothing special about it. They're just KUBs. The only difference is we do them in time sequences. So now for the first couple of hours, again, depending on your facility, you either do them in 15, 15 increments or 30 minute increments. So depending on what your facility is or how they do it. So now what I'm gonna do here is after I've taken this shot, I'm gonna share my, my radiograph with, with my doctor and I have to wait another 30 minutes to do my next KUB. You guys follow? Okay, so while we're waiting, while we're waiting for the next KUV, again, it can be 15 minutes, it can be 30 minutes later, but while I'm waiting for my KUV, I'm gonna have my patient get up and walk around because we're trying to get that contrast through their small bowel. So they're not just gonna sit up, they're physically gonna get up on their feet and walk around the department. Um, so when you bring them into the hallway, you're gonna tell them their, their parameters. You know, Mrs. Jones, just walk all the way down to that second bathroom, don't go past that, and just walk back. So I wanna be able, you wanna say I wanna be able to find you so that when we take our next shot, I'll easily just grab you and pull you into the room, but I want you to keep in sight. So go that far and go that far, that's your parameters, okay? So that's why we say bring something to read. They're gonna be looking at their magazine, they're gonna be playing you know, on their phone or whatever, but we need to keep them busy in between the shots. It's also important to tell your, if they're, if they're here with family members, you gotta let them know that these procedures can take anywhere from 15, 20 minutes to maybe three, sometimes four hours. Why does it take that long? What's the whole, what are we trying to accomplish here when we're taking these KUVs. Path of contrast. We're waiting for the contrast to fill up the entire small bowel. And our digestive tract works differently from one to the next. On the average, it shouldn't, the procedure shouldn't take more than 30, 45 minutes for their entire small bowel to fill up. But if there's an ileus, if there's some kind of obstruction, now it's gonna take a long time for it to fill, okay? And again, an ileus, again, you have, the, they call it an obstruction, an ileus is an obstruction, but the ileus can just simply mean that the, con, the contest is just moving around, not, is moving, not moving around because there is no movement of the small bowel. So it's not a real true obstruction per se. So we have them walk around, okay? Then we come back and now we're gonna do our third KUB. And again, depending on your hospital, it could be the 45 minute shot or it could be the one hour shot. You guys follow? Now, generally, this is the practice. For the first two hours, we take them in 15 to 30 minute intervals. After a couple hours, now we start shooting them at one hour intervals. Again, if it starts taking this long, there's generally some kind of problem with their small bowel. But again, it shouldn't, it sh regularly it doesn't go past two hours. Sometimes they do, okay? So for the first two hours, you do your regular intervals. After the second hour, then you do one hour intervals, okay? And again, we do these KUBs over and over and over again until the entire small bowel fills up. Well, how do we know if the entire small bowel has filled up? 
see on the x-ray. You're going to start seeing what's next. The large bowel. That's how you know you've got there. But to be sure that we're in the right place, once we get in around, once the contrast fills that vicinity, the doctor is going to come in and do his spot image using the floral machine. Okay. So the doctor is going to come in and uh, use this floral machine to look at the junction between the small bowel and the large bowel and what is that area called? Del ileocecal bowel. So again, once you start filling up the area, but to be sure that we're in the right place, that we are seeing the entire small bowel, the doctor's gonna come in with the floral machine, compress the abdomen to spread the bowels around and focus just on that ileocecal valve. Take a snap of it, a spot film, and now we're done. Okay. questions. So that's all they are. They're just PA, KUVs. Why do we do PA? Why not AP? Because it spreads the bowels when you're laying on your, on your belly. That's why we prefer a PA. But going back to Kate's question, well, what if they can't lay on their belly? Then you do APs. There's no set rule that says you have to do PA. Okay. But based on the uh, patient's condition, you may, know, you may not have that option, so you have to do AP, okay? But we, pr we prefer PA. All right, so that was with the upper GI small bowel combination. What if it was just a small bowel series? Um, SBFT is, what, is generally what you would see on a requisition. What does SBFT stands for? Small bowel series, it's also called a small bowel follow through. Small bowel follow through, SBFT. Okay. So again, this is just a standalone small bowel series. We're not doing it with an upper GI. We're not doing it with an esophagram. Patient just shows up for a small bowel series. That's it, okay? So for the small bowel follow through, the prep is the same as an upper GI. Okay, a lot of this stuff is duplicated from other slides. Okay, so it's basically the same information. The prep is the same as an upper GI. Also want to keep the patient NPO for approximately eight hours. No smoking, no gum chewing. Okay. The scalp is going to be a, what kind of a KUV? It's going to be a high KUV, so you're going to take a high KUV. And before you begin the procedure, you want to make sure you have two eight ounce cups ready of barium or maybe iodine. Again, we got to figure out, are they indicated to use barium or are they contraindicated? If they're contraindicated, then we have, we have to use iodine. The problem with iodine is that visually it's very, very difficult to see under x-rays, but it's better than nothing. Professor, yes. question, when we have our um, two eight cups, uh, oh, I mean, eight ounce cups ready, right? right. Eventually it's, it settles, so do we need, like, before we give a second? Yeah, so the question was, so do we need to, yes, if we're, we're preparing the, the cup of barium, what you actually should not do is don't pour it in the cup, leave it in okay. the jug or in the container, Just and don't pour it in the cup until they're ready to drink it. Mm. Okay. Okay? Thanks. <clears throat> All right, so we're going to take a scalp. Show it to the doctor. Share the uh, history with the doctor, and then let's say, okay, go ahead and begin. <coughs> so when you go back into the room to begin the procedure, you're going to give them their first cup, their first eight ounce cup of barium. And again, start timing the moment that they start drinking the barium. You got to note the time that they start drinking the barium. Why are we timing this? What's the purpose of timing these shots? Because again, there's an average time that the contrast should go through the bowels. And if it's taking a little bit longer, again, it's indicative of something else going on. 
and that's called we times images. All right, so they drink the barium, okay? Time, make note of the time, they start drinking it, and then you, uh, you take your KUB. PA KUB. Okay? So you take your first image after the first cup. Okay? Then you're going to set them up and have them start working on the second cup. Okay? And depending on what your protocol is in the hospital, you're either going to take your 15 minute shot or wait a little bit longer and take your 30 minute shot for your second KUB. Okay? And then again, you take your third KUB and you keep taking those KUBs until it reaches what? Until it reaches what? Colon. The ileocecal valve. Okay, so they just keep, keep taking those x-rays until they see that ileocecal valve and when the doctor feels like you're, you're in that area, then he'll do the fluoros uh, fluoroscopic procedure to focus on that valve. And again, in between shots, have your patient walk around. What if the patient can't stand up? What if they can't walk around? <coughs> Going back to your question. Well, they'll just be seated. Okay. Well, what we're going to do is our fluoroscopic units, the table, has the capacity or capability to be tilted up. So we're going to put them on an RPO position. RPO position. Why RPO? Isn't that the direction that the stomach empties? Yeah, the pylorus goes this way. So we put them in RPO, it starts to drain this way. So we're gonna put them in RPO and we're also gonna tilt the table up a little bit, but high enough that they don't slide off the table, okay? But high enough that gravity is going to take place to move that contrast around. <laughs> Are you okay with <laughs> Is that your drink? Oh, it's his drink, okay. I thought he was just drinking your drink. No. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so if the patient can't stand up, RPO them and tilt the table up. Okay? All right. Does that make sense, guys? All right. <coughs> so, scout radiograph, 16 ounces, uh, small bottle only series. So, again, take your scalp. Uh, they're going to be drinking a total of 16 ounces of barium, note the time. Uh, depending on your, your uh, 15 minute, uh, I'm sorry, 15 increments or 30 minute increments. For the first few shots, this is what it's just telling you, for the first few shots, you're going to be taking high KUBs, okay? Because the contrast should only be filling the stomach and maybe just the proximal portion of the, of the small intestines. So your first couple of shots are going to be high KUBs. Then you go down to a regular KUB when the distal segments of the small bowel should fill up. <clears throat> well, how do you know if you're going to center high or center low? Well, you're the ones taking the images, right? So look at where the barium is in your previous shot and adjust accordingly. If the barium is still high, still keep it at a high KUB. If the contrast is moving more to, towards the middle and distal part of the small bowel, then start taking your regular KUBs. Make sense? Any questions? All right. So all the shots, all these uh, KUBs are done PA. Okay. So again, high if the contrast is still high. Uh, so these are not set rules, okay? Look for the location of the, the barium, but at least for the first couple of shots, it's highly likely that the entire bottle is gonna fill up, so make sure, just do high KUVs. Then look at your images, and if it's moving, then adjust your KUVs accordingly. Okay, so high KUVs is about, again, one and a half to two inches above the crest, if it starts to fill out the distal segments of the small bowel, then start doing your regular KUVs. Prone, again, prone, okay? Are we good? 
So again, I've, up, I've uplo uploaded these slides to your guys' canvas already. So, um, all right. Uh, PA projections, 30 minutes, one hour. So an entire small uh, contestant should be demonstrated. Time interval markers. Okay. Uh, possible Trendelenburg. In some cases, you may have to take the shots in Trendelenburg to separate the loops. Again, that's going back to decades. If a um, patient is an AP projection, supine position, uh, sometimes you may have to tilt the table to open up the loops to get a better visualization of the bowels. And so here we have a spot image of the ileocecal valve. It's that tiny little piece right there that the doctors are looking for. That little segment right there. And once they're able to visually see that fluoroscopically, they take their spot film, their spot image, and we're done. That's it. Okay. <coughs> All right, um, before I talk about this, just a quick question. Um, quick question or quick review. So after they are done with this procedure, after they're done with an esophagram, after they're done with an upper GI or a small bowel, what are you gonna tell your patients post-instruction-wise? What are you gonna tell them? Water. Drink plenty, plenty of water for the next few days, okay? What are you gonna tell them that they might notice? Okay. White poop. Okay, white stool. Okay. And so they should go back to normal stool color in a few days. What else are you going to tell them? What if they get constipated? Not taking a lot of mild life. Mild Wild life. Take a wild laxative. Okay. So have them take a uh, laxative. And then what? And if they continue to be constipated, if they're having abdominal pain, now what? Call your doctor. Very good. Okay. All right. So the next couple of slides, a few slides I'm going to be sharing with you here are the special types of small bowel series. Uh, this one involves putting an uh, intraplysis catheter down into the stomach and proximal du uh, duodenum. I'm trying to get in the habit now. Um, and so this, is, this tube here is going to be inserted down through the nose, possibly through the mouth, mouth but it's going to go down the esophagus, through the stomach, or uh, just in the proximal duodenum, duodenum, okay? And this is done uh, under uh, fluoroscopy, okay? Why, are we, why can't we just blindly put it down there? Who said that? Okay, so remember up here, the oropharynx, there's two pipes, two openings. One goes to the lungs, the other one goes to the stomach. So we're going to do this fluoroscopically to make sure that it goes down the right pipe. Because if that ends up in the wrong pipe, now we're shoving contrast down the lungs and we can drown the patient. Okay, so we're going to observe this under uh, fluoroscopy. So the patient's going to try to swallow the catheter, but we're also going to, uh, with aid of the peristaltic activity, rhythmic segmentation, we're gonna to try to get that catheter where it's supposed to go. Okay. Uh, so this one, entroclyses, <clears throat> uh, we would do this for individuals who may have a small bowel obstruction, Crohn's disease, and also malabsorption syndromes. If you recall what I said a, uh, a while ago, this is done as a double contrast study. Done as a double contrast study. So catheter is advanced to duodenal, uh, duodenal flexure. Thin barium is pushed into the catheter, followed by air or methicellulose to give it the double contrast appearance. And again, it's very, very good for observing those different types of pathologies. Ileus, um, what we say, ileus, malabsorption disease, Crohn's, because it, it gives the lining of the intense, uh, intestines a, a, a better visualization. It's not solid barium. Okay. So the advantage of entroclysis is best for determining an ileus, Crohn's, and also malabsorption by providing double contrast. The bowel loops are distended and the mucosal walls are better visualized for a more accurate study. 
The disadvantage here is that there's increased comfort because now what, what's going on here is you're pumping air into the small bowel. It hurts. Okay. The small bowel is not designed to expand it like a large bowel is. So it hurts when you have that additional air in there. Um, it's also longer to do. And because you're pumping air in there, there's possible perforation, not only by the catheter, but also the amount of air that you are uh, pushing through that catheter. So now you have distension as well as catheter types of perforations. <coughs> the intubation process, also known as a small bowel enema, what they're placing there is either a nasogastric tube or a nasoenteric tube, NG or NE tubes, nasogastric or nasoenteric, down the esophagus, in the stomach, around the bowel. And this is a little bit different. They try to put this catheter a little bit further down into the bowel segment. So, um, the intraplysis catheter, it sits in somewhere around the area of the duodenum, okay? But the NG tubes for intubation goes a little bit further past the first segment and into the second segment, the jejunum. So it's around the duodenal jejunal segment. Again, this is done under fluoroscopy. We don't want to blindly put that tube down there. And with the aid of uh, peristalsis, some rhythmic segmentation, we are able to position that. Once we get contrast in there, again, they're just KUBs. KUBs, time KUBs, and we keep on going until uh, the entire small bowel is filled. You guys, there have been times where um, a few times where I did small bowel series on an inpatient that couldn't come down. So we gave them a contrast up in their room and every, you know, the first, the first couple hours was hard because we shot a portable KUB. Have you guys done portables yet? Okay, we shot portable KUBs every 15 to 30 minutes for the first two hours. And then every hour we went upstairs to get that plate underneath them and do one hour of KUBs. At some point after six hours, the doctor said, stop, we'll do one the next morning. Because it wasn't moving anywhere. And then we shoot a KUB the next morning and the contrast would still be in the same place. Yeah. <clears throat> All right, so some additional notes. Again, this is a reminder, have the patient walk or lay the patient on the right side in between images. Explain to the patient and family about the length time of the uh, exam. Give the patient something to read. Uh, make the patient comfortable by, if they're gonna be laying there for a long period of time, make sure that there's a pad on that table. Have your time markers or be ready to annotate your images accordingly. Um, I don't know why this is, oh yeah, keep them informed. So it's gonna be long. Also keep them informed if they're gonna be in their room a little bit longer than what they anticipated. Now here's collagenic meds. This is interesting, collagenic meds. So, if the contrast isn't moving around very well, there's a couple of tricks that the doctors and the technologists do. One of the things that we do is we purposely talk food with them. They're NPO, they haven't eaten, they're starving. So when you start talking food with them, you hear this, grr, 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 grr. <laughs> Because now they, they want to get something to eat. Show them okay. pictures. So we, yeah, so we, we enhance that activity by talking about, what were we talking about last night in 252? We are talking about what? Big Macs. Yeah. Big Macs. So we talk about steaks, talk about pasta, get them hungry, and hopefully that'll work. If that doesn't work, okay, the next thing that the doctor may have you do is you give them ice water. Ice water also is in that contraction, okay? So those who, who are you know, into drinking lots of water and working out, it's not so much that you drink plenty of water for your activities, but if you drink ice water, 
because it's cold, it increases, you guys are hearing me, right? It increases your metabolism because your body's heat is trying to combat that cold, it increases your metabolism. But also, also at the same time, the cold water also helps in contracting the contents of your food to aid digestion. Okay. Uh, you want to know another collagenic medication? Iodinated contrast. Iodinated contrast. Not only is it a diuretic, it, it promotes intestinal contractions. And it doesn't get in any reaction with barium? So it just mixes, yeah. yeah. So I'm going to share this with you now. And we'll talk about it next week. But someone who has a bowel obstruction, lower bowel obstruction, the doctor may order a, uh, an enema, an enema for therapeutic purposes. Not for diagnostic purposes, therapeutic purposes. And so don't be surprised if you get somebody who has bowel obstruction, fecal impaction, lots of poop in there, fecal impaction, and the doctor orders a iodine enema. Because once you get that iodine in their large bowel, they just flush right out. So be ready to wear a gown, shoe covers, gloves, a mask. Yeah. They order those procedures for therapeutic reasons, not for diagnostic reasons. <laughs> so iodine has the capability of doing that. Just to wear a raincoat. <laughs> wear a raincoat. <laughs> okay. Here's a trick, guys. If you if you guys come, uh, if you have somebody who um, odoriferous, it's a nice way of saying it, right? Odoriferous. <laughs> Don't just wear a mask. Put something in the mask, like perfume or cologne. What also works is if you put Vicks underneath your nose, okay, that also works. Doesn't work all the time, but it works. But those are some ways to get around that. Yeah. Okay, any questions? Oh, tea, coffee too. Tea and coffee are also uh, helps in the contraction. We drink coffee, don't we go straight to the bathroom? Mm. I keep saying we. <laughs> Just the guys. Don't we? <laughs> All right. All right. So, um, before you guys go, um, what I'm going to have you do is I'm going to have you guys go on a uh, let's see a quick ten minute break and we'll come back. So go on a ten minute break and we'll come back. But we're done with the lecture portion of it. So I will do the large bowel next week, and then I will give you guys an option of. Um, Maybe taking a longer break. So right now, let's just do, uh, do a quick break because I got to set up for something.